Get into Gelt, we're going to Gelt. <laughs> Something oh, like. I have a question. Yes. Or should I wait? No, 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 See the Holy Spirit in yourself, but not in others. Your thoughts will find you. I don't understand that sentence. No, well, it comes in the joining process. So that's the course places a tremendous emphasis on our, on our joining. It's only as we heal all of our relationships. Mm -hmm. um, I tell a story in a book that's coming out in April about um, you all know about the, the penitentiary in uh, Pennsylvania. What was it called? State. It was about Philadelphia, that um, the Quakers back in the 19th century, the Quakers thought that <clears throat> if you would put somebody <clears throat> in isolation, that they would get in touch with their spirit, <clears throat> like monks, you know, going into their cells and getting quiet. So they did this thing where they put these prisoners in absolute solitary confinement, thinking that they would get in touch with who they were and spiritually, and they would be healed. Just exactly the opposite happened. They all went mad, and they all went insane, because they had no physical con, they were not, even when they came out of their cells, they had bags over their heads to keep them from being able to see anybody. They were absolutely prevented any kind of communication, right? That's why you don't get into heaven alone. <clears throat> and nor would you want to, you know. The, the Course says joy comes in sharing. If you think about the most joyful experiences you've had in your life, they've all always been something where you've been sharing something. That's why we like to have company or, you know, or we, to visit with each other, to go out together. Because we are not just one isolated being. Now, getting quiet for a monk or a Quaker might be a little bit different situation, but these guys who were horribly burdened with guilt in the first place, <laughs> you know, just got deeper into guilt rather than getting out of it. And they didn't know their way in. They didn't know, and they didn't give them any instruction on how to get in either. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it, it sounds like a lot of, you have to have a context before right. you can surrender. <laughs> There's right. sort of like, it, it reminds me of some of the old stories from the 60s, you know, where people who would freak out on acid and they'd say, well, you didn't have a good trip guide. Right. If you had someone there to talk you through this, you right. know, to give you some context. And the same thing with like sensory deprivation tanks. People use them to expand their, their experience spiritually. Right. But you don't just slap somebody in there with no preparation and no understanding of, right. of what it's about. But I just wonder, did they tell these prisoners anything at all? No, uh, nothing. They what were, they were was, doing? It was a very yeah. cruel misinterpretation of what they thought would happen. They would, no, no contact was allowed at all with anyone. So, it, it, of course it's a fail. It's, they, they, I did, that's where we get the word penitentiary, by the way. There was, uh, they, they're going to do penance, right? Okay, let's go to guilt, shall we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, We've well, yeah, already done penance. <laughs> now the fun begins. Now the fun begins. <laughs> this is in chapter uh, 5, section 5, the ego juice of guilt. <coughs> this is the first time that guilt is talked about in the course, but as I said earlier, uh, we'll go into it much more detail when we get into <coughs> chapter 13. So let's go back to the Adam and Eve story just briefly. We've already did this uh, one of the first nights of or days of classes. <coughs> the moment the split occurs in the mind, the first thing that Adam does is he runs and he hides in the bushes. Now he hides because he's felt as though something has gone wrong, right? Now what's, what's gone wrong is that he has attempted to think a thought outside of the mind of God. 
And you can't really do that, and you can't hurt God. <laughs> but just the thought that you could separate yourself from God means that you've not hurt yourself. Right? Because, you, because you, for the same reason we were just talking about, about relationships here, because you're now alone, and you're now isolated. One of the primary uh, experiences we all have of this as children, uh, probably the first experience we all have of this as children, is lying. And uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And if you tell me that you don't, I'll say that you're a liar. You'll <laughs> 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 be right. <laughs> it would be right, right? <laughs> Uh, because it's, it, this is a defense. This is a, there's, the Torah talks about there's two basic lines of defense. The first line of defense is that we hide. The second basic defense is that we project. But with guilt, we both hide and project our guilt. The first thing we do is we hide. And there was probably some time when you were a child. Let's say, who's the first person you lied to? Mm -hmm. Of course it was your mother. <laughs> right? And it happened a little bit like this. Mother walked into the room and said, What happened here? <laughs> and you said, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I, I think maybe, I think the dog did that. <laughs> Anyhow, it wasn't me. Right? So, but that's, that's the guilt. And in the Adam and Eve story, when God finds Adam hiding in the bushes, he says to him, Why are you hiding? Hmm, never hid before. I mean, what, why, why are you hiding? And Adam says, Because I was guilty. Uh, not guilty, naked. <laughs> Which is guilty. You know, that's, that's the naked part. He felt guilty. And... God says, who told you you were guilty? I mean, where did this idea of, of, of naked come from? Right? Or naked and guilty being the same thing. And <clears throat> what's happened is the split has come into the mind. He's experienced the separation between good and evil. So now there's an evil possibility. There have never been evil before. Now we've got evil. Animals don't have evil. This is a very important point. That's one of the reasons we love them so much because they, they do not have split minds. They just are there. That doesn't mean they wouldn't defend themselves if physically if they got into a, a situation. But they, we have a, a, now about seven or eight weeks, we have a kitten, a new kitten in our house. And it's just, uh, we got this, it's just, yeah, it is. I mean, it's just this joy. I mean, she's brought so many laughs into it. She just keeps doing these funny things, you know, flipping over, and I intended to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> all perfectly innocence. We love innocence. But the innocence has been lost. The moment that the lie has occurred, there's a separation into oneself. And the moment we lock into ourselves, it's this disgusting feeling. Or the, the feeling as though maybe you've hurt someone through a lie or through a misuse, a deliberate abuse of some, some, some selfish act on your part. And then guilt comes in, and it's really an awful, awful, awful. See, because now you do really feel separate from, from God. So, guilt, let's go look at this. Guilt is self-accusation. Uh, let's read the, from the course here. Guilt is always disruptive. <clears throat> Anything that engenders fear is divisive. But now, the minute we get guilt, we also have fear. There's two elements to the fear. The first element is being found out. The second element is being punished. Because one has been found out. But there will now be some kind of retribution. Now this is, the Course is really clear. This is not the way God thinks. God does, is, does not believe in retribution. As a matter of fact, God does not condemn at all. Period. That's why this is such a different interpretation than traditional Christianity. That's why there's no such thing as reparation within the Course, or repentance. There's no such thing as repentance in the Course. What's, what's required is awakening, that we wake up 
to the truth of who we really are, not that we continue to get like, caught in the guilt that I'm, I'm lowering myself into a position of, again, separation and division. Back to this quote. Guilt is always disruptive. Anything that engenders fear is divisive because it obeys the law of division. If the ego is the symbol of the separation, it's also the symbol of guilt. Guilt is no, is more than merely not of God. It is a symbol of an attack on God. It's an attack on God because I've tried to make myself separate from God. To say that I can be separate from God. Going to the top of page 8. If you identify with the ego, you must perceive yourself as guilty. I've bolded that. If you respond to your ego, you will experience guilt, and you will fear punishment. So when we stop finding guilt in our brothers, we stop finding guilt in ourselves. So it's not looking for the guilt anywhere in the world, which becomes a bit difficult because there's a lot of stuff out there that we could find a problem with. I mean, it's just it's so easy to just, just just look around. But we stop it. I want to stop that. And stop that in me. So that whatever I see I'm seeing in a, in a loving way. So again the ego's insane and we say the two ways of handling guilt. One is bury it. This is one of Freud's greatest discoveries. We repression, deny, don't look, and the consequence of this is that it makes us sick. As a matter of fact, the Course in America would say it makes you physically sick, in addition to being psychologically sick. It's also the cause of illness. Now that doesn't mean if you get, you know, don't get down on yourself if you get sick. <laughs> it's just making the situation <clears throat> even worse, which is kind of hard to do. Because then you're going to say, well, I must have done something wrong, so what did I do that was, was wrong? But it's really the sick mind that's causing consequences for, for the body. So I bury it, I don't look, I hide. And there's lots of ways of hiding, we talked about them earlier today. The second alternative is that I project my guilt. Now we don't usually think that when we project onto somebody else, that what we're really doing is projecting our own guilt. But that's what, otherwise we wouldn't project it. If we didn't see it in ourselves, as Kurt said that earlier today, if I didn't see it in myself first, now that doesn't mean the problem isn't there, but it's that I make an issue of the problem. <coughs> if I make an issue of the problem, then it's a problem. It's not to say that someone doesn't have a, it's not an alcoholic, for example, right? It's not that they're not. It, the question is, do I make this into such a problem that I'm now stuck on the problem? Or can I let the situation be what it is? Okay. Uh, going to nine. <clears throat> so the ego comes up with this interesting solution. See, so God has no intention of punishing. But um, we decide that we're going to help God out on the ego level. So what we say to God is, look God, you don't have to punish me, I'll do it. <laughs> okay? And uh, there's a whole host of ways that I can do it. Uh, one way I could do it would be I could neglect to take care of my body. And then my body will get sick. And then I will be punished. Um, and you don't have to punish me. Okay? This is the ego is so... Thank you, this way. to the bottom of eight up on nine. So the ego thinks, believes that God punishes. Right. So the ego punishes itself before God punishes. Right. Because God's yeah. punishment has to be greater than right. your own punishment. Exactly. Okay. So we're doing God a favor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> of course, God doesn't think that way. Okay. But actually, in kind of in well, we're projecting onto God. We're projecting onto God. But in traditional Christianity, we do kind of think that way. Yes. Right? Not kind of. No, yeah, no, not kind of. <laughs> <laughs> right. For sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Right. That's why also karma doesn't really work in the courts. You know, this is one place where it's, it goes different from Eastern philosophy, because it's not about 
paying a penalty of sin because we've done something wrong in the past. It's always a matter of, again, awakening, coming up to the realization of the truth. Of I started to read on the bottom of 8, 1 to 9. I said before that if illness is a form of magic, it might be better to say that it's a form of magical solution. The ego believes that by punishing itself, it will mitigate the punishment of God, which is what we're, what you're just talking about. And now I'm down to the next paragraph. Yet even this, it, yet even in this, it is arrogant. It, in punishing itself, it's arrogant, right? It attributes to God a punishing intent, and then takes this intent at his own prerogative. It tries to usurp all the functions of God as it perceives them because it recognizes that only total allegiance can be trusted. The total, uh, that's the, the way we do it, is with the total allegiance. And going on down. What <clears throat> you may can always be changed because when you do not think like God, you are really not thinking at all. I want to emphasize a line in the Course we, we mentioned earlier, it says, the thoughts you think you think are not your real thoughts. That's because, because the thoughts that we think that we think are fantasies and dreams and illusions and projections and places that we're being caught. Our real thoughts are really the thoughts that we think in alignment with the mind of God. Those are the only thoughts that could possibly be real. Everything else dissipates, disappears, is a fantasy, doesn't last, but it can hold my mind in the moment in such a way that it can cause me to, to suffer. I can think that it's real. Right, last time when we were looking at chapter 4, it was the only time in the whole course that it, it talks about this, but there's this line where it says something about the real you that you really are, and like there's a real you, it, it does talk about your creations as something which is real, right? Which has nothing to do with anything that you create in this world. And, then, and it says that these have been preserved for you, this has been kept for you. It's like we're all strangers in a strange land. We've come on this journey <coughs> into this world and <coughs> we get caught up in this dream and we're caught in a maze, and we don't know <clears throat> we don't know our way out of the maze. And yet, it's really just a matter of, of not trying to find your way through the maze. It's a matter of transcending the maze. Mm. And you know, like getting above the battle. Once you're above the battlefield, and you look down and you see it, and you just see how silly the whole thing was, and how you would just. Mm -hmm. That's why when you wake up in the morning, and you go, oh, "Thank God, that was just a dream," mm -hmm. right? And that maybe also be happens when we die, is that we kind of wake up and we say, thank God. <laughs> you know, that was just a fantasy. I just, uh, I fell asleep for a while and thought I was Tina and I lived in a place called New York. It was all very strange. <laughs> See, I got your name in. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I just want to, because it, when you said the thing about karma, I don't see there's any conflict with the Course okay. and Karma because if you're in a maze and you bump into the wall because you didn't make the right turn on the corner, well, that's your karma. You bumped into the wall because you were heading in the wrong direction and that wasn't the clear path. Now, what we do in religion is we personify karma and we say that's what God is doing as punishment. If I bump into the wall because I went the wrong way, that's not God punishing me, but it is karma. It's just the reaction to what yeah. you're doing. That's a much better way to look at it. <laughs> you can also look at it, actually in terms of the course, but any experience that we have is really a necessary part of the journey. Because it's the experience that we're having. So therefore, whatever lesson it is that I'm learning, I must be learning it through this process. That's why I can't bitch and complain because of whatever circumstances I find myself in. Because it's, I, I designed this lesson for myself. Okay. Um, let's look a little bit at time and eternity. Um, just a little bit. <laughs> um, 
right of nine, you have elected to be in time rather than eternity, and therefore believe you are in time? Yet your election is both free and alterable. You do not belong in time. That's why, it's, that's like the Course saying, you do not live here. This is not your real home. And that's why when people have these near-death experiences, they really get that very clear feeling that they're going home again. This really isn't it. That the body isn't it, and the world isn't it, and time, which is a story. That the story really isn't. The story is a dream. Right? Your place is only in eternity where God himself placed you forever. Remember the kingdom always, and remember that you are part of the kingdom cannot, your part of the kingdom cannot be lost. Because it's eternal. How could you lose something which is eternal? Um, then we went, we've already gone over the, the passages where vengeance is mine, etc., so we can skip that. And then uh, to the decision for God, the last section in this part. I like this opening section. Do you really believe you can make a voice that can drown out God? Do you really believe you can devise a thought system that can separate you from Him? Do you really believe you can plan for your safety and joy better than He can? This is really the, the arrogance of the ego. Let's look at... Uh, <coughs> some of you got books with you? I don't know whether you all got books with you or not. But, uh, 90. Uh, uh, chapter 5, section 7, the very, very last, just before chapter 6, the last two periods. I want to read this, and then uh, the, the last part, I want to suggest that we, we say this together, okay? I've sort of delineated it on here, but I think it would be better if we just say it together. Let me read you the first paragraph. Decision cannot be difficult. We just talked about how difficult the decision process is, right? But it's not. This is obvious if you realize that you must already have decided not to be wholly joyous if this is how you feel. Therefore, the first step in undoing is to recognize that you have actively decided wrongly. So we're going to step you actively decide you actively made the wrong choice. But you can actively decide otherwise. This is getting control of your mind. You can actively choose otherwise. And notice here that of course, be very firm with yourself in this. This is because we're so undisciplined. It's trying to get us to be more disciplined. Be very firm with yourself in this, and keep yourself fully aware that the undoing process, which does not come from you, is nevertheless within you, because God placed it there. Your part is merely to return your thinking to the point at which the error was made. That's why the Course says that one way we go backwards as we go forward. We go backward, we go back to the point at which we decided wrongly. We undo that decision at that point, and then we go forward. Your part is merely to return to the, your thinking to the point at which the error was made and give it over to the atonement in peace. Let's give it over to the undoing process in peace. Say this to yourself as sincerely as you can. Remember that the Holy Spirit will respond fully to your slightest invitation. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to read a, a phrase. I'm going to, because I know everybody doesn't have a book. I'm going to read a phrase and ask you to repeat that phrase, okay? Ready? I must have decided wrongly. I must have decided wrongly. Because I am not at peace. Because I am not at peace. I made the decision myself. I made the decision myself. But I can also decide otherwise. But I can also decide otherwise. 
I want to decide otherwise. I want to decide otherwise. Because I want to be at peace. Because I want to be at peace. I do not feel guilty. I do not feel guilty. Because the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision. Because the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision. Got that pretty good. If I will let him. If I will let him. I choose to let him. I choose to let him. By allowing him to decide for God for me. By allowing him to decide for God for me. Is that in chapter 5? Huh? This is the last page in chapter This is the last paragraph in chapter 5. One more I'd like to do that's very similar to that is, and we will not be seeing each other again until next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as strange as that oh, sounds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, <coughs> I wanted to do one of the last lessons in the course. Um, uh, page 486 in the workbook. 365. 360, 361. Okay, so it's 365 days. I'd like to suggest that if you do nothing else for this, this is a good way to end you. This is only two sentences. But I'm going to memorize these two sentences. They're the it's the last workbook lesson. And be, and be able to say this to yourself at any time. Okay? And so I'll read it and we can do it. That's actually three sentences I take it back. <laughs> I see three Page 486 in the workbook. Okay. <laughs> Four, 486 in the workbook for those of you who got it. This holy instant would I give to you. This, this holy instant would I give to you. Be you in charge. Be you in charge. For I would follow you. For I would follow you. Certain that your direction gives me peace. Certain that your direction gives me peace. Just think about uh, doing that, especially. But, 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 that's repeated for four days, the last four days of the year, but it's a good one to... Who's you? <laughs> Who's you? Yes. Well, you is... You is... Uh, In Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit or Jesus or God. It doesn't really make any difference. You we're see, just... We're really following the higher... The higher authority. Okay. It's capital to you. It is capital. Anything that's capitalized, capitalized mine, capitalized him, capitalized you, it's always referring to the Holy Spirit of you. Right. You know, I think you should do what you feel most comfortable with. Some people like to, to like pray to Jesus because there's an image. I mean, because you can sort of visualize. Now, we have these pictures that probably never look like that, but <laughs> you get some sort of image in your mind, right? The Holy Spirit is more difficult to, to kind of pin down into an image, right? And God is even more difficult than that. But it really doesn't matter. It it's all winds up being, there's a line in the Course where it says there's no point at which the Son begins and the Father, be the, the Son ends and the Father begins. Right. So if there's no point at which the sun ends and the father begins, that's why, the, again, this whole course, and it seems like a huge thing it's asking of us, the goal of the course is oneness. And that, for all of us, which means that there's only, ultimately, only one mind. And that's a very scary concept to the ego. Because to the ego, it looks as though if the one mind wins, I lose. But every mystic who ever had a mystical experience will tell you that when the one mind wins, you win. And now you do you win, you win big time. I mean, it's a, it's a trend, and you, it, it's hard for us again to understand how, how little we are. By how little, I mean how, some of you, 
and, and even Alexander's experience, <clears throat> he talked about what he called the worm's eye view. And in, in Missouri Mystic and, and my death experience in the 76, I call it the ant's eye view. And it's just, it's hard to imagine that that we're working from an ant's eye view. But in terms of what we know of the of the cosmos, so as the as the as this view opens up, it just gets more and more exciting because it also is is a matter of joining. It's it's a matter of uniting. See, when we fall in love, we get very excited because we're uniting our mind with another mind that we're that we're falling in love with. And there's actually that's the highest human experience. If you can think of anything higher as a human being experience they, with union with God. But the union of God, the Course is very clear, only occurs as we unite together as one mind. Because that's all there is. So, yes, Alex. John, um, so when I look at a situation, I'm upset. I'm very upset, whatever it is, the dogs, whatever it is, I'm upset. And there is theoretically a way of looking at it, or to the horse, where I will not be upset. That I will look, nothing has changed. So, but when I get upset, I want to mitigate. I want to move it around, I want to move away from it, I want to change it, I want to. The horse says there's a way of looking at it that is completely, I do nothing, but I can see it completely different, and that's the whole Spirit's way. And that's what we're trying to do is, rather than change it, we're trying to recognize that we're, if I'm upset, that means I'm looking for the ego, and I'm, I'm asked to shift to the whole Spirit. Yeah, right. And there's one way of doing that. I mean, there's one mm -hmm. point of view that is, yeah. that is. That works. Yes. Right. That's why, again, in terms of the course, it's it's a mistake to think about fixing somebody else, or to correcting somebody else, or to, to fixing somebody else's mind. You can't fix your own mind. Forget about being. Yeah. You can fix your own. Yeah. I mean, you really can't. All all you can do. I mean, this whole course. That's why I try to put some emphasis today upon will and decision and choice and power to be able to do this. All this is, is a book of teaching that tells us what the right ideas are. But he, he can't do it for us. He can't make that decision. That's why when Ruth said, well, the, the Holy Spirit really doesn't have a job, you know, the Holy Spirit's only job is to show you the right way. Imagine that you're a wise, that you're a parent, as I'm sure the bunch of you are, right? And you're a wise parent, and you know the proper direction to provide for a child. That doesn't mean the child is going to do it. <laughs> that means just because you know from enough experience with life what work, what works and what doesn't work. You can't keep them from going the wrong way if they're going to go the wrong way. And if they do go the wrong way, what you've got to do is just to keep loving them through the whole process, even though they may not appreciate your loving them <laughs> through the process. It's a very difficult job. Being a parent is a particularly rough one. Right? Because we run, it's, it's like being having this God's relationship with us. But what, what does God do? God lets us be who we are. Can't change us. But see, the good news is that God knows you're coming home. God knows, and God knows that, that when you come home, there are going to be open arms and just welcome home and you were lost, but you've been found, and you were dead, but you've come back to life again, and that's the only thing that matters. And there's nothing else you can do at the time. But also, to keep in mind this emphasis upon discipline and development of will, and choosing, making this very simple choice on how it is that we let little tiny thing take us off course and drive us crazy. Are there questions? Yes, Shanti. Yes, I, 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 I'm looking at the words 
side something that I, I feel very strongly about, and that the course doesn't seem to think there's anything in my way of So let's think from a parent's perspective. <coughs> parent says that the child is doing something wrong, and the child has a reaction to this very, very understandably. The parent is having an experience that's perhaps inappropriate, as the child may be doing something that's inappropriate. But I don't know whether or not it's wrong. I think that we're dealing with experiences. The experience all the time, as a parent, as a mate, as a friend, as, as a student even, it doesn't matter. We're always looking at it from the way we feel about what is being imparted to us in the, in the, in the situation. There are no rights and there are no wrongs. In a world where we have one mind, we have to come to this ultimate conclusion because what I did, I, met, I did because I thought it was right. You certainly didn't think it was right if you criticized me or judged me. So I think that what the Course is trying to say is that it's a real challenge to be able to look at the world, recognizing that our world is we done it, the way we've done a job on the world, we really have. We were given the Garden of Eden and this is it. But we have to take a look from the perspective that we are being taught to train ourselves to see things differently when what we're seeing annoys us, troubles us, bothers us. And that's the, that's the challenge that we're given in the course, is to be able to say, how could I see it differently and not feel totally challenged by what I'm looking at. This is the work we have to do, and it isn't easy. But if you keep practicing it, it helps right. a lot. Try it. You might like right. it. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with being a parent, of course, is that you see the, the child making decisions that you know are going to be difficult for them, that they're, mm -hmm. that they're setting up a difficult path or difficult road. And that you can't do anything about that. Anymore. I'm not going to justify the parents intrusion on the life of the child, no, I agree. It, it, it's overwhelming. Right. And the child, on the other hand, is saying, allow me to be me. And right. God is saying, I'm giving you the opportunity to be you. And if what you're doing makes you miserable, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the prodigal son story again and again and again, right. which is a really, really wonderful story in terms of understanding this whole process. We don't do anything to interfere. Uh, we have about 10 minutes if anybody would like to. Amy? Yeah, I just was reading this old joke about the boy who prayed to God for a bicycle. Uh -huh. And when God was not forthcoming, he realized that he had it all wrong. What he really needed to do was steal the bicycle and then pray for forgiveness. Right. <laughs> when we allow ourselves to feel guilty, we reinforce the error rather than allow the error to be undone. But could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, it's a funny story, but... Uh, in the context of the Course in Miracles where you're not supposed to feel guilty and you're not supposed to um, blame. But you probably would feel guilty. I mean, you would feel guilty if you did something that violated another person or another situation. That's just a joke. I mean, yeah, no, I know it's a joke. <laughs> it's a but, it, but, it, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> There's, 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 some, there's some truth in it. Okay. I'm not suggesting we do things and then ask for forgiveness. <laughs> it's just we got it backwards. Yeah. All right. And Dawn. Um, my understanding that I've been working with is that there really is no returning to God or no welcome home because I never left. Right. So how does the prodigal son story, as I believe I know some of that detail, what does that really translate into? A story. <laughs> yeah, what I mean by that is we live in time. So in, in time we see things sequentially. Okay. We see a, a process that, that seems to be going on. So any story is a process. Something went wrong, something uh, happens that, that brings about the correction and then there's the return. It's a typical kind of you studied hero mythology. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Joseph Campbell taught it, uh, you know, it's just that same process. But you're right, of course, that there's no actually there's no actually return. When you wake up, you don't return; you just wake up. But we need a way of talking about it symbolically, just like we need a way of talking about what the Holy Spirit is. And because there's no really Holy Spirit, but there's this function, 
if you will. So we give it a name, we call it the Holy Spirit. And we give it images like dove or fire or something like that so that we can have a visual for wind or breath or air that makes it a little bit better so we can sort of see it. The course is filled with, filled with metaphors, is it has to be filled with metaphors because it's the only way that we can understand. And there's a point, I think, in this, where it says God weeps. Well, God doesn't weep. You know, God doesn't have tears. God doesn't even have a body, let alone weep. But it, it, it's just, the implication is that we're not whole until it all comes back together again. A part is missing. Somebody else? Okay. Um, as I said, we're not going out afterwards unless you want to. Just go. We can go on your own to uh, the uh, to the restaurant, and um, I will send you a note. And I think it's January twelfth next year that we'll get together again. You want to do the Lord's prayer? Let's do the Lord's prayer. Not the Lord's prayer. Let's do the the Course in Miracles version. It's on page 12 at the bottom, okay. <coughs> Again, we pause at every comma, <coughs> stop at every period. <coughs> Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and we are not in our nature. Our holiness is yours. What can you give me us that you forgive us when yours is perfect? The sweetness of forgetfulness is only an unwillingness to remember your forgiveness in your love. Let us not wander into the temptation, for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given, and accept as His is which you create and which you love. Anybody want to comment on your cards that you have on your, any cards that seem to speak to you? <coughs> Has anybody got this, the same card twice? Yeah. <laughs> no? You did? Okay. Another time, not here? Another one. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you in uh, January. <laughs>